Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I couldn't be more excited about today's guest on the podcast. She is an author, speaker, host of one of my favorite podcasts, Crystal's Chronicles, and so much more, Crystal Evans Hurst. Crystal is about to launch an amazing devotional on September 1st called The 28-Day Prayer Journey, A Daily Guide to Conversations with God. And when I heard this title, I just knew that we had to have Crystal on the show to share about it. So Crystal, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So we like to ask all of our podcast guests a just for fun question. So um, what is your favorite prayer closet? Where do you like to go to be close to God? It could be conventional, like an actual room or a chair or something totally off the wall. Uh, my car. Yes. I don't you. know that I go to my car. It's just like when I'm in the car, that just seems to be a good time. Or when I arrive home in my car, I don't go inside because there's some things I need to talk to God before I go back inside with my vanity. <laughs> yes. And you have five kids, right? Mm -hmm. Three are and still at home. I have two adult children and three boys that are still here with, with us. Yeah. So especially when you have a big family at the, the car is it's the car in the shower. Like those are the times because <laughs> yep, the bathroom the isn't even sacred anymore. Right? <laughs> like, especially when they're little, I guess when they're bigger, it's, it's okay. But yeah. Um, so tell us about yourself and your family and what led you to write this devotional. Well, my, um, my family nuclear, myself and my husband, our five kids, two girls gone and three boys still at home, or I should make that alliteration work. I could say three girls gone and three boys still homebound. <laughs> but, um, um, but in my, uh, extended family, I'm the daughter of Tony Lois Evans. And some people may have heard of Priscilla Shire, Anthony Evans, Jonathan Evans. So I'm one of those bunch. Um, and so we've you know, of course been steeped in spiritual legacy all of our lives, which we're very grateful for. And I know that my grandmother prayed for us and I know that there is a spiral notebook with her prayers for her grandchildren. Um, and I wanted to pray more, but I just wasn't in the habit of praying as consistently as I wanted to. And so um, I launched a 28 day journey of prayer on Instagram a few years back. And by the time I was done, I had enough content to put together for a book. But the goal of that was if I tell them I'm going to pray, and if I come here and say to my audience, however small it might be, I'm going to write a prayer every day and a prompt to pray every day, then maybe I will show up because there's an accountability built in. And so I was able to do that by committing to that period of time. And that's where the idea of the book came from for um, the 28 day prayer journey is if you can say for 28 days, I'm going to show up and I give you the prompts and I give you some thoughts and I give you space to document your prayers. If you want to write them, that would serve the reader in a way it served me when I walked through that process a few years back. Yeah. And I loved that because I mean, I, you could just, the, the thing that I really appreciated about the book was it's not just, okay, here's a devotional each day, but it's three parts. It's morning, noon, evening. It's like a three part checking in with God throughout your day. And I just think that that is such a good way to make a habit. Um, and I just, I felt like um, as you were going through, it was, I don't know, just an invitation into you know, join with me on this journey. Before we get into the details of the, the journal itself, though, um, I wanted to ask you about prayer guilt. And just to start off, what you would say to someone, and, you know, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, I had the best intention. So when, when I found out we were doing this interview, I wanted to go through, like, you know, all 28 days. And, and by that time, it was a little bit shorter. But I thought, I'm going to do, you know, morning, noon, and night we got a puppy and the whole, you know, all my best intentions flew out the window. <laughs> and so I, you know, for someone, whether it's COVID and your life is turned upside down or whether it's, you just, you know, fall off the wagon and you wanted to pray more, what would you say to someone right now or someone in the future that got your book and was all excited and got started and then sort of fell away that's feeling guilty for not praying more? Well, I think if you as a person had someone in your life who you really, really loved and they, um, you wanted a relationship with them, they said they wanted a relationship with you, but it had been a while since they'd called. When they call, are you going to say, well, you didn't call me, so I don't ever want to hear from you again? Are you, if you really love them, are you going to be glad that they called? 
So I think we have to say that the person who created the opportunity for prayer wants us to call. He's interested in hearing from us. And just like the prodigal father was grateful that that son came home, even if you're not prodigal, God of the universe who said, I'm going to make a way for them to walk in fellowship with me is happy when we come to talk to him and doesn't want to hold over our heads the fact that we have it for a few weeks. So why would we hold that over our own heads? All that that guilt does is keep you away from God because it keeps you saying, oh, I don't want to start and then not, you know, and then not keep going. But that keeps you from doing the very thing that the person who created prayer as an opportunity wants you to do. So you have to recognize it as a distraction from the main thing. And the main thing is that you talk to God as often as you can, as frequently as you can, as consistently as you can. But all that said, if you fall away, just get back to doing it because he wants to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. And and I will and did and kind of got back on and started going back through it. But um, but yeah, I think that's just something that um, a, a format like this is so useful because you can pick it back up. And it, if it's not 28 consecutive days, it's, you know, something that yeah, you can just pick it up and keep going jump back in. So that's right. So you talk in the book itself, you talk a little bit about this experience. You mentioned your sister Priscilla, and you mentioned the experience of seeing Priscilla on the big screen in War Room, and kind of before that, praying her through the filming of that movie. Um, Can you talk about the prayer journey that you went through and some of the questions that that brought up for you? You mentioned kind of feeling like, well, I'm, I'm intense and intent on praying for her now. Why don't I do this all the time? What was that? What was that journey like for you? Yeah, I think it's just realizing that we pray at acute moments of need or desire. And while God wants us to use those moments to pray acutely, he wants us to also be aware of how often we are talking to him ongoingly just because. The only time you talk to somebody that you loved was when you needed something from them. That does not speak to ongoing great relationship. It speaks to using somebody. And God is no different. I mean, he's happy to hear our requests, but ultimately what he's after is relationship. He's not after, his goal is not being the Santa Claus in the sky. His goal is for us to know him and for us to know that we are fully known. That happens through ongoing conversation and relational engagement. And so it just made me say, what am I missing out on in my relationship with God Um, by not having ongoing communication, but being driven to prayer when there's something that's wrong or something that I need or something that's extra hard. Yeah, and I think it's so important to, it's kind of like a, a two-sided coin. You, I think if you look at it as just a, an obligation and you just do it because you have to do it, you're not going to experience that joy until you actually connect with God. And then once you experience the joy, it kind of spurs you on to, to connect with him more when it becomes about that relationship. Mm-hmm. So. Exactly. Exactly. So, so there's a quote from your book. Um, It says, um, we aren't called to walk in our strength, but to work in his. And I loved that. And I just wondered how did that, how has that shown up in your life and how has prayer affected those, the weaknesses that you find that you need his strength for? Well, I think it just gives me somewhere to go. I mean, I'm not just left to cry and be upset and then have no resolve but there's a place that i can go where god can answer but he can calm he can bring peace he can bring clarity he can bring change but unless i go that doesn't happen so it's just and again it's also just relationally just saying god hey i had a bad day it's been a bad week it's been a bad year and i'm going to come to you because i know that you care and so i think that that takes a weight off of you when you're willing to say okay, I can go to God, not feel bad that I'm having a bad day, bring it to him because he actually wants to know about everything and then not feel alone. Because often when we're having hard times, we feel alone, but we don't have to when we use any time to come to God in prayer. Yeah. And I think that, I think Satan will use that isolation to trap us and, you know, in our feelings of inadequacy and, you know, want us to feel like, you know, nobody understands. And I, with a relationship with God, you always have somebody that understands and someone that can, that's right. You know, be there Mm -hmm. even when people can't be there in the way that you need them to be. That's right. There's another kind of prayer that you talk about too. Um, 
you say, Lord, I can't say it in words. Will you please just listen through my heart? So what advice would you give somebody that doesn't have the words to pray and, and feels inadequate in that way in their prayer life? The thing is, is just to keep talking, you know, um, I would go to my mother's house often um, before she was sick, of course, during the time when she was sick, but just before for no reason. Didn't have anything to say. Just went over there to be there, you know, to be there. And um, and then when things came up, maybe, you know, I'd say something here or there. But for the most part, she'd be sitting there watching Family Feud. I'd go over there and sit and watch Family Feud with her. And I think that we have to give credence to the fact that God is more powerful than we are. He's not like us. The Holy Spirit can translate what we say, what we'd like to say, how we know, we don't know what to say, but showing up to communicate, even if we don't know how to communicate the deeper things, to be able to know that the Holy Spirit can do that and us showing up, that's the key. So sometimes with my mother, there would be times where we didn't plan on saying anything deep or talking about anything deep, but because I was there, I got the communication. Oftentimes with God, we will shy away if these prayer experiences, these prayer moments don't seem life altering, life changing, something you know, the fireworks aren't happening. But what if you showing up is the first step in getting some things communicated to you or having things bubble up in you to communicate to God that you wouldn't even think of if you just weren't in his presence. And that's a part of that waking up in the morning and not starting your day until you um, say, Hey, the day is yours, God. I yield my day to you before I even start. What's going on that you need me to know about today? <laughs> I know what I had planned, but what do you have planned? Or showing up to God and saying, listen, I don't even know what to say. All I know is I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you, but you need to know I'm anxious and I don't even know about what. What if showing up and just sitting in silence with God is one of the ways that the Holy Spirit can share with you spiritually what's going on? There have been major revelations. Um, uh, that only come when we make space for God to download them. You know, it's like after reading his word and you read it, you did the Bible study, but what if he needs space to cause the full realization of what that scripture, how it should take life in your life. If just having silence in prayer, cause you know, prayer can be a two way conversation mm -hmm. that being silent and waiting for God to speak through his word, um, through the conviction in your heart by the power of the Holy spirit to say that in those moments, the hard ones, the easy ones, the ones I have no words for, that he can translate what I can't even say or use the moment that I'm still to download what I didn't even know that I needed to know. Yeah. And we're not used to white space either. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. making just silence in, in our, this day and age isn't an option. Every, every moment is packed with, you know, if you have a spare moment, you're looking on your phone to check your email or checking mm -hmm. the news or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it, with God, I think we have to train ourselves to listen and yeah. And I mean, I've thought about that, you know, if you don't have the words, let the Holy spirit take your words to God, but we can't forget that listening. I love that. The way that you put that about, um, downloading, you know, what, what God has to say to us. I think that's so important. And I think it can be a gift to not have the words sometimes because it makes us stop. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. And oftentimes we miss the opportunity to stop and the beautiful connection that can come with God when we stop, we cease doing and just start being with him. Yeah. And that that can be for us to understand that that in itself can be prayer, even if you're not actively hearing from him, just that work that he does in helping you process whatever, you know, your mm -hmm. thoughts, your, your problems mm -hmm. in that, in that space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So talking about worry and concerns and, and chronic, uh, chronic fear, chronic worry, things like that, you talk about how your ability to release your concerns and your worries is a function of the depth of your relationship with God. And so how would you counsel somebody that isn't having success releasing those concerns or fears or worries and feels like less than a Christian or feels like giving up? What, what would you say to her? Keep coming. <laughs> Keep coming. <laughs> because the, the thing, the problem is that the, the feeling that you're describing isn't the problem. The problem is what that feeling makes you do. Mm. You know, 
that that's the problem if the feeling that there's something not right about how i communicate with god keeps me from coming to god it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy but if you keep coming then you give god the opportunity to show up in ways because you're talking to him because you're spending time with him because you're leaving white space to hear from him for you to go oh all this time i thought nothing was happening and look what was happening behind the scenes in me and through him but you yeah. only get to find that out when you keep showing up yeah and just even going through the motions without, um, even if you don't see the results, just to keep keep going through the motions of putting it there and putting it out there and letting them know. Um, so has your personal journey with this, has it been a linear journey where you feel like step by step you get, it gets easier and easier to give the worry up to God? Or is it more of like an up and down and up and down? Or what does that look like for you? Or what has that looked like in different seasons of your life? Well, it's looked different because I'm different. Um, you know, I think about dieting. Do I know what I'm supposed to be doing to be a healthy weight? Absolutely. Do I know what things typically start happening when I start going up the scale? Absolutely. Do I know what works for me to get back to the place that I need to be? Absolutely. What has grown in me is not that I wasn't aware of my different seasons with food. What has grown about me is my awareness as the seasons change so that I can self-correct before I go too far. Mm -hmm. And so I think with prayer, it's the same thing. You have to know what your rhythms are with prayer. And there are rhythms. There are going to be times when you get really busy or things are good and we're motivated to pray when things are bad often. And so you say, oh, wait, like here's my, here's my plumb line. And what is your plumb line? Like, so for many of us, when you talk about weight, it's a scale, right? Or it's a size. So what's my plumb line? How do I know when I'm where I'm supposed to be with God? Does that mean that in the mornings I wake up or in the evenings I'm on my knees? What does it look like? Am I praying regularly with my family? Am I writing in my prayer journal and keeping track of the answers to prayer that he's provided? What does that mean? What does that look like? And once you say, here's, here's what it looks like when I'm in a healthy place with God. Well, what does it look like when I'm not? And if you can give a visual to some of those things or some indications that, you know, I wake up rushing. If I'm rushing to work, that's probably an indication. I'm moving away from the time that I need in the morning to at least give God a good morning. How are you? And that rushing could be an indicator or, you know, falling asleep uh, before you're actually ready for bed. And then when you get up, you're just kind of falling into bed. That's an indicator that I fell asleep before I'd actually closed down my day properly. If I'm that tired, something needs to adjust if I want to make sure I have time and energy to spend a little bit with God before I go to bed. So what are the things that get in the way of you having an awesome prayer life and letting some of those things become indicators, positive or negative, that when I'm doing this or not doing this, this means I need to reorient so I've got time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When you are, when, when you talked in the book about when you're feeling overwhelmed about the big picture of things, because I know that a lot of people right now just feel kind of overwhelmed with a lot of the uncertainty of just life in general. Um, when you feel overwhelmed by the big picture and, and seeking God's will for you, and I know that I've been here, in the book you talk about focusing on your next step and just what he wants from you today. Um, what does that look like for someone that is looking for maybe guidance for the big picture of their life or um, facing uncertainties about really big things? How, how do you personally go about seeking God's next step in your life when things are overwhelming? How do you bring it back? And, and what are the actual practical steps you go through? to ask for that and find it? Well, the, the, the overarching principle is to do what you can with what you have um, and to go with the light that he's given until he gives you more light or more clear instructions. And I think for all of us, we know what the right thing is to do right now, right now. Now, we may not know the bigger answer for that. Like, like for example, something horrible. Okay, I'm in a really, really difficult marriage. Um, I'm not even sure if what I'm experiencing is abuse or not. I'm not even sure, but I know something's not quite right. Okay. Well, what do I do? Lord, Lord God, how do I, I want to, I want to honor you with the choices that I make. I understand that you hate divorce. I understand that you, you know, but I'm in a really tough scenario and I don't really know what to do. Okay. But today, if today something happened that made you frightened, uh, and not anything overt, but just covertly that made you frightened for your well being. Even though you don't know the bigger picture answer, you may know that right now, that means you need to change locations. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Um, or another would, example would be, 
I know that I'm supposed to write a book. I don't even know what I'm supposed to write the book about. I just know I'm supposed to write and I've been praying about this, asking God for direction. What is my next step? I don't really know as it relates to writing this book. But what you can know that has he given you the ability to write? Do you struggle to write? Okay, I know I'm supposed to write a book. I don't know about what, but I can still journal every day as an act of honor to the gift that he's asked me to give to this world until I know what it's supposed to be about. Or I feel like I'm supposed to write a book, but I'm a horrible writer. What do I do? What do I do? Well, until he tells you what to write about and when to write it, you can work on your writing skills, take a class, take coaching. So I think that even in bigger picture decisions, when we say, what does God want me to do? Mm -hmm. If we know the direction that he wants us to head in, or just generally even deciding about a fork in a road, we can at least take one step, one step in honor of what we, of what we do know, what we do know. That's good. That's really good advice. Could you, um, I have a couple of other things I want to talk about other than the book before we sign off, but I want to save that so we kind of end with book stuff. But before we, uh, before we do that, I just, I saw a YouTube video of your dad that you shared and that your sister Priscilla shared. Um, and I just have to talk about it just in light of the events surrounding George Floyd's death, um, Amard Arbery and, and just the racial tensions that our nation is seeing right now. Um, I just really wanted to talk for a moment about this video that you put out that I thought was just this, um, for me as a white American, being able to see this window into the talk that your dad, Tony Evans, had with his kids, his grandkids, particularly his grandsons. Um, I just, I, I just wanted to ask you, can you just tell us briefly what, what that talk was about? And I'm going to link, if that's okay, can I link to it in the show notes so that people can actually watch, watch this sure. video? Okay. Um, but can you just talk about what, what went into that talk? And was this the first talk or was this one of many that happened um, between your dad and his kids and his grandkids? Well, I think there's an ongoing conversation. Um, for example, every first Sunday we get together as a family. Uh, we pray together as a family. We, um, we, uh, the, the kids recite scriptures. And so if there's something that is important for our family, we have that form. I mean, our, our, all of our siblings and our, uh, the grandchildren and the nieces and the nephews, we are literally together once a month, every first Sunday. And that does not even count the birthdays and the special <laughs> events and all that. So there's this ongoing opportunity to have conversation. In fact, I just told my boys, write down a question for your grandfather. I said, because here's what I know, that when he's gone, there'll be things you want to know. Yeah. So every time we're together, ask him a question. And then my boys are looking at me like, are you kidding me? Like every single time. <laughs> and they <laughs> will you not don't regret understand, it. <laughs> you don't understand the value of what you have until you don't have it. Mm -hmm. So every time. But but the thing is, is, as a part of this ongoing conversation um, with my father, with the boys, with their father, you know, there's just opportunity as you sit around a table on a first Sunday or every evening at the dinner table to talk about the things in the news, um, to talk about what's happening. So it's, you know, for us, just as a black family, a lot of these things are ongoing conversations anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, you know there, there are moments that are memorable because there's, they're kind of like, you know, this is, this is a, a culminating moment and we need to have some specific conversations right now, mm -hmm. but they've been a part of ongoing conversations and ongoing cultural understandings for a long time. So we did that because, um, you know, we wanted the boys to see my father's perspective in, at, a, at one point in time when everybody was there to hear the same thing, but there, there are ongoing conversations um, all the time just because there are lots of opportunities for us to do so. Well, and for me, you know, growing up when I heard the talk, it was the talk about sex, you know, you're going to have the mm -hmm. talk with your kids, but for <laughs> black families, I think it's, it's coming to light for those who are not people of color, that there's another talk that isn't part of everyone's life. And, and I think we have to, I love the fact that we can see a window into, there's a conversation that has to be had in some families that I think people need to see that don't have to have that same conversation. And then I might even go a step further and say, we, we need to have that conversation too. 
mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. our kids. And I have had that conversation with my kids because I just feel like it's important for all of us to be in this together. And um, I just thought that what your dad talked about and the way that he presented it is just kind of a great guideline for how we can be talking more openly with our kids. I just want to ask you this question. Um, what would you say to anyone listening that that doesn't feel like racism is an issue anymore? I would say if people who are the people who are affected by it are telling you it's a problem, then even if you don't see that it's a problem, you need to listen. Hmm. The one of the worst things in the world is to go to the doctor and many doctors, and some of us have had that experience where we go from doctor to doctor and we're saying something's not right. And then they dismiss it. And then three doctors later, they discover a problem. It's not that there wasn't a problem. It's just that maybe the lens that the doctor was using, the test that they used, their experience didn't bring light to the fact that your internal struggle physically was something that needed to be dealt with with a plan. And then, you know, we heard it all the time. You know, it's the story of the Bible, a woman with the issue of blood. She'd been to all the doctors and nobody could fix it. But if somebody is experiencing bleeding and they're saying, listen, <laughs> the blood won't stop, the headaches won't stop, the pain won't stop, uh, this, this feeling won't stop. I mean, so many women have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, but first for years, they were just told that nothing was wrong with them. You know, you're just tired, take some iron pills, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. If the person who's having the problem, who's in the pain, who has the hurt is saying there is a problem and because of your education, your experience, the tests that you're running those discussions by say that there's not a problem, but the person who's in pain is saying there still is, maybe you need to do more homework. Maybe you need more exposure. Maybe you need to read some more literature. Maybe you need to run different tests or develop a new perspective. Talk to different colleagues so that you can see that something that you may allow to go undiagnosed because you don't see it is indeed a problem you just didn't see. And so in the body of Christ, when we talk about loving our neighbor, loving them is not saying, and it never is saying that the pain that you feel isn't real. That is never going to be love. Love can say, I'm so sorry you're experiencing this pain. I'm so sorry that there's a problem And I don't see it, but I'm willing because I love you to do the work of maybe adjusting, increasing or undergirding my perspective Mm -hmm. so that I can, through the lenses that I have, develop more lenses or more exposure to things that I just didn't know were a problem. But to say it's not a problem, that is not love. It's not love. Now, we're going to always have, because we have our different experiences, our background have our perspectives on things, but to, but to start with the, there's not a problem as opposed to, you know, I've just got to take another look at this or tell me, explain this to me, Mm -hmm. explain this to me and seeking to understand before assuming that you're understood. We have to learn how to live with a language of love so that we can actually be the body of Christ because that was the premier thing he said what we were supposed to do is to love one another. And it's never love to say your pain isn't real. That is so true. And you have some great resources I came across on your website. So I'm going to link to that as well. Just very basic for someone that, that is looking to find out more. You have some really great resources. So I'm going to link to that also in the show notes for anyone that's interested. And we could talk so much more about this, but thank you for, for sharing that. And I know that our time is coming to an end. So I just want to ask how people can find your book, how people can connect with you online? Yes. Well, you can connect with me. It's easy by going to crystalevanshurst.com. The book is crystalevanshurst.com forward slash pray. And that page is all about the book. Um, The good news is, is if you're interested in the book, if you purchase it before the release date, you'll get access to some really great pre-orders. There are 12 topical prayers in the book. After you finish the book at the back in the appendix, there's 12 prayers that are topical just to get you going. If you just are like, I just, I don't even know where to start. So you can just read them. Um, We put 30 more as gifts for people who pre-order. Those are uh, pre-orders to read or pre-orders to listen to because there are audio books recorded for those. Spotify playlists, uh, instrumental playlists to set the tone for prayer, um, worship songs to set the tone for prayer, prayer cards, I mean, all kinds of great things. And so if you're like, I want to, I want to take this seriously, I'm going to get the book. I would encourage you to get it early so that you get all of those tools free to help you launch into or to continue the journey that you are. 
good. Oh, that is great. So yeah, you definitely want to go over to crystalevanshurst.com. Now that's crystal with a C-H, C-H-R-Y-S-T-A-L, evanshurst.com forward slash pray to take advantage of those sweet pre-order bonuses for the 28-day prayer journey. And this is not her first rodeo. She has other books too. So when you visit her website, check out her other books. She's got great links and resources on her website. Um, in addition to one of my favorite podcasts, Crystal's Chronicles. So yeah, um, before we go, we would like to pray for you. So could you let us know how we can be praying for you today? Yes. Well, like, like everybody else around here, we all have lots of things on our plate. I've got kids at home. I've got work. We're in the middle of a move. Uh, my husband has health challenges. And so just God's grace to prioritize each day. I only have 24 hours like everybody else does, but to do what's most important and for him to give me clarity on that for, uh, for each day on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time. Thank you for Crystal. Thank you for just her heart that she poured out into this book. Um, we just pray that, that it will be a blessing to so many women, God, that you would open doors for it to reach more women than, than she ever imagined, um, that this guide would just allow people to connect with you and not just to connect with you while they're reading it, but to just establish a lifestyle of prayer that will just carry them on um, and stay with them. We lift up Crystal to you just with her, all, all the iron she has in the fire, Lord. We just pray that you would help her to know her next steps, just exactly what she needs to do each day, each moment, give her, um, just equip her with everything she needs to be a mom, a wife, um, to do her ministry and, and just give her every single thing that she needs, Lord, and, and that she would be able to do all of it for your glory and that it wouldn't be an either or where one thing is going to, um, suffer when the other gets going, that you would just give her balance and, um, focus and energy we lift up her husband to you, God, that you would just place your healing hand on him, that you would sustain him in his health issues, and that you would just bless her entire family and um, just bless her ministry, her podcast, her writing, continue to pour into her creatively, um, and just, just be glorified in every single thing that she does. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a comment to let us know what questions or topics we can address in future shows. Then hop over to prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal to download your free prayer guide. We're so glad you joined us for today's show, and we wish you God's deepest blessings as you draw closer to Him and change the world one prayer at a time.